So next up we have Thomas Lyon. He's CEO of um, Taruga uh, Minerals. He's also the MD for, for Strike Line. He's got a background in, in iron ore, um, but has some particularly interesting ground. It's, it's showing a little bit of the diversity of mineralization styles that he's going to be t um, talking about. And thank you very much, Thomas, for, for flying in for this um, workshop. Thanks, Adrian. My pleasure. Just lucky that the borders open up on the day I had to be here uh, to get to South Australia in time for this event. So really, really pleased. We'll also be presenting at the SAMEC conference on Friday and I uh, hope to see most of you there as well. So we're Taruga Minerals. We're exploring for world-class copper systems in South Australia. We've got IOCG projects and sediment-hosted copper projects, which I'll take you through today. So we're situated in the what we refer to as the G2 structural corridor, all of our projects. The two ICG projects are the Flinders project and the Torrens project. It's on the margin of the Gawler Craton. It connects up to some of uh, DGO's ground there. And uh, we've got outcropping Adelaidean uh, rocks there and then the, and par partially covering the Torrens hinge zone there as well. Uh, at the moment, we're doing most of our work at the Mount Craig Copper Project. That's purely in the, in the Adelaide fold belt. It's a 1,500 square kilometre project. We've been expanding it ever since we first picked it up. And we further, you know, we recognise there was a lot of potential there from the beginning, just from the amount of copper which is at the surface. And as we've gained our IP, we've built that project up to a real company scale project. So yeah, there's just the G2 structural corridor. This is not exact outlines, but there's the Stuart shelf where most people are exploring for uh, said copper at the moment. Um, we've got the Torrens Hinge Zone roughly in there and then the Adelaide Fold Belt where we're currently focused in the Mount Craig Copper Project. I suppose the, you know, we've really got the same rocks uh, more or less that are in the Stewart Shelf. The only difference is ours are sitting at the surface and the mines are at the surface and we can map them. We can use every exploration tool on the planet. Um, some of those uh, tools can't be used in the, when you have so much cover like you can have in the Stewart Shelf, so we're very lucky. Um, we've got comparable grades and thicknesses to the deposits which are being found in the Stuart Shelf. Uh, in some cases, we're seeing some higher grades. The difference is, so far, we haven't seen any cobalt in the sediment copper deposit at Waiaka that we're drilling, but we are seeing anomalous cobalt across the project, and we're currently doing quite an ag aggressive drilling program down at Morgan's Creek in the south, where we're seeing rock chips over a large area which have copper cobalt and other critical metals in them as well. So. You know, it's, it's structurally complex where we are at Waiaka. Um, in some cases, it may be slightly less uh, simple than, than some of the uh, mineralization we're seeing in other parts of the Stuart Shelf, but it's definitely complex. And I believe there's certainly uh, potential for bonanza zones that have been missed so far, and I'll show you why. So here's the Mount Craig Copper Project. That's not all of it. That's 1,500 square kilometers now. That's about 1,000 square kilometers. We've got our cropping mineralization over 34 kilometers of strike. You can see that there in the green dots. There's actually a lot more than that. We basically, weekly, weekly we find new copper um, outcrops at surface and historical mines that aren't recorded. 34 kilometer long major structure, the Warumba Anticline, that we believe is a basin controlling structure amongst others that are there. And actually that structure extends out to Waiaka in the north. There's a, there's a separate substructure there, uh, which isn't on this map. Uh, there are a range of commodities which there's potential for here. The Warumba anticline itself hosts a 34 kilometer long diapyric system, which you know is potentially one of the largest exposed diapyric systems in the Adelaide Rift Belt. We've got predominantly Umbratana, Umbratana group uh, rocks, Kalana group, which have come up in the diapyric breaches from deeper beneath, and we've got the Burrow group rocks as well, Skilligalee dolomite. You know, we've got the exact same setting as the Burrow monster mine. We've got the basal units of the Skilligalee dolomite contacting on uh, a diapyric breccia. That's our new borough prospect in Morgan's Creek, and, and that's what produced the you know sub sub 150 kiloton copper metal um, deposit at Burrow, which pretty much also saved uh, a, a, also saved the South Australian economy. And I think at the time it was the world's largest operating copper mine. So as I said, we've got an analogous uh, geological setting to the Central African Copper Belt. There's really no reason why we can't have Kamoas, and and no one's spoken about deposits like Kapushi yet today, but we strongly believe there's potential for capuchi style polymetallic deposits, um, which some believe are associated with diaphorism uh, in, in this project and in the Adelaide Fold Belt as well. We also see the mafic volcanics here. Some of those are rafts which have been brought up in the diapirs, and some of those are in situ. We've got contact metamorphism, we're seeing scans, and we're even seeing gabbros down in uh, Morgan's Creek, which is a little bit different than, than what we're expecting. So not all of the mafics are rafts that have been brought up. 
uh, well, they, they've all, all been brought up, but um, they're not. Some of them are in some ways semi in situ, where they're still in place. And we've got massive diapiric breaches, as I said, and, and the major structure there. So we've got all the right ingredients for large said copper deposits and polymetallic deposits, and we're seeing all the right kind of smoke at the surface. So I'm not going to go too deep in this strat column. We've already been through it so much before. It's just highlighting the various locations through the rock groups that I've spoken about already where there are different copper deposits in the Adelaide Fold Belt. Um, some of the major ones aren't on there, um, but you can. we've already spoken quite a bit about them, so I, I won't go too far. But they're all exposed at the Mount Craig Copper Project because of the setting that we're in. This is a mapping that was conducted by Wolfgang Preece uh, some time ago. I really thank him for this because it's a fantastic piece of work and it covers essentially the entire Warumba dive here and it's been a great tool for us and I found it to be very accurate. So thanks, Wolfgang. Um, we're, we're filling in uh, some, some finer scale uh, observations here um, through the detailed work that we're doing. Um, we, are, we are aggressively drilling. We will have, we will have drilled 12,000 metres on this project this year by the time the year's out. And those span across 34 k's of strike, the northernmost prospect at Wacker and the southernmost at Morgan Creek. Just for those of you who haven't seen a, a model of a diapiric uh, intrusion before, um, this is a model. Uh, this is specific to the Warumba uh, diapir, and, and uh, we're doing a lot of drilling now, so we're learning a lot more, and we've got a lot more uh, access to a lot more data than Wolfgang had when he put this together, um, which we'll be happy to share. But essentially you can see the Tindalp and a shower member there just un so at the top you've got the Tapley Hill formation the lower Tapley Hill formation underneath that you've got the Tindalp and a shower where we're seeing all our said copper deposit a lot of the said copper mineralization at Waiaka and then you can see the diapiric um, breccias which are intruding up into those uh, younger rocks of the Umbaratna group and the mafic volcanics in there as, as rafts and intrusions so here's Waiaka it's our northernmost prospect at the, at the 34 kilometer long project uh, we have inherited a historical oh, sorry yeah so it's a it's a high grade sediment hosted copper discovery basically that came up in in may uh, there'd been some historical drilling there before we'd seen some copper people knew there was copper there there's 13 or 14 mines that were operating there in the 1800s um, but there never really been a systematic drilling program going across it and there had been some electrical uh, geophysics collected but never used and, and drilling um, never really got around to testing some of these anomalies so uh, we're the first company to hit high-grade copper there. We've hit intercepts up to um, 7 metres at 1.8% copper, 11 at 1.5. We're seeing chalcosite rich mineralisation up to 9.5% copper in a metre, chalcopyrite dominant mineralisation up to 5.8% copper in a metre. And we know there's a lot more potential there to see higher grade and thicker zones than what we've seen so far. And that's what we're in the process of working out how to identify. So we've got three kilometres of strike identified so far by drilling. That's simply because we've only drilled three kilometres of strike. And we're also seeing not just a long strike, we're seeing mineralization across strike by 1.5 kilometers. That's why we know this system has scale. We know it's a sediment hosted copper system. Um, there is variation in where the grade is controlled and how thick that grade is, but people um, you know, have a false belief that copper, sedimentary copper systems are very simple and they're consistent all the way throughout the system. It's just not true. We see the typical uh, standard you know, transition here from uh, malachite, chalcosite, chalcopyrite to bornite as we go down dip from surface. As I said before, we've got the same geological setting as Kamoa. Could there be a Kamoa sitting here at Waiaka that people have been walking over for the last 120 years? Uh, there's no reason why they couldn't be. Could there be a smaller version than that as well? Definitely. The ore was hosted primarily in the Tindalp and Shower, which is the very base of the Tapley Hill formation. Uh, it's, it's kind of quite dolomitic. Uh, it's, it's always altered here at, um, at Waiaka. Every time we drill through it, we know immediately that we've hit it because it comes out as a black, black powder um, through the Cyclone and NRC rig, and you can identify it easily in Diamond Core as well. The underlying Willyurpa formation looks, in, it looks, when you drill in Diamond Core, very similar to the, the overlying Tapley Hill formation. However, when you drill it in RC, rather than coming out as black and grey chip, it comes out as almost pure white. It looks completely different. As soon as you wash it and put it in the chip tray, they look like the same rock. I've already taken you through a few of the significant intercepts, but here are a few key drill sections from Warumba 19 and Powder Hill. So I've already said we've got the standard Gossen into leached, into supergene, into hypergene mineralization. You can see uh, up on the top left of the uh, screen there, that's our Powder Hill. That's where we're seeing chalcosite mineralization. The actual altered unit there is up to 20 metres thick of black powder, uh, the black powder unit that we refer to, that's why we call it Powder Hill. 
uh, individual meter there at 9.5% copper. So we know there's potential for good high grade chalcosite and we, we've seen the full range of copper minerals that you would hope to see in a system. Uh, over at war number 19, the two images on the right, a long section at the top and a cross section uh, below, we're really seeing uh, getting into the hypergene zone. So it's more chalcopyrite dominant. Um, the the Warumba 19 mine at the top is an iron gossen. Uh, they were mining oxide copper out of. And we, we took a look at that, saw a historical drill hole where a diamond core hole had, had hit uh, about a meter at 0.3% copper and ended in it. And uh, we were pretty confident they'd just gotten onto the, the target unit and hadn't drilled through it. So we drilled a full section out there and um, second hole that we drilled there, we hit 11 meters at 1.5% copper and we were pretty happy. So that was at 85 meters depth and we knew we were onto the, onto the right stuff. You can see in the long section there uh, at the top that um, it, it better displays some of the, the, the variation of grade across or, or along strike or across what is, what is a, a structural uh, zone. And this remains open. So that's a late time VTEM image. Um, I'll go into this in a bit more detail in the next slide. These are the Gossens that we're seeing at the surface, which were mined historically. They actually go very quickly in some cases into Chalcopyra borna. You can see the lag, lag material around the historical mines contain a lot of sulfide material in them. I don't think they really knew how to, how to handle it though. Then we go down into the kind of super gene chalcosite layer. This is a, 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 a image of me holding that powder is the 9.5% intercept of what we believe is chalcosite dominant mineralization from about 15 meters depth, so very shallow. Uh, and the core images below is the full altered unit in a parasitic anticline at Powder Hill, which has produced the thickening of the sequence, the target sequence. And therefore we know that there are going to be packages in this area which are thick and which can, can contain uh, much higher grade, much thicker mineralization than what we've seen so far. And then we go down to our kind of primary Chakapirite Bornite uh, zone. Now that, that rock that you can see holding uh, on the top there, that's actually right near surface at Warumba 21, which is a 1.5 kilometers long strike, not in the Tindalpana shell. We know there's stacked lenses of copper mineralization in this system where it isn't just one unit we're targeting. If you find the right structures, you're going to see multiple stacked lenses of copper. And we're already proving that out there now. So geophysics, we've inherited, been lucky enough to inherit some really good data sets. We had the historical IP, which was the most difficult thing that I've ever had to go through the process of trying to digitize from old paper uh, records. Uh, but we have extracted some value out of that. We later inherited and were able to process in more detail the historical VTEM. Now these tools have been very, very good at mapping the overlying pyritic shells, which are a exploration tool for us and a marker horizon and allow us to identify that there's actually 58, you know, along with mapping as well, there's 58 kilometers of strike of this uh, unit outcropping on our project. It's also helped us to see where the unit uh, steepens, the dip steepens and, and uh, thickens, but it's not been very good. The electrical methods have not been very handy in identifying where the grade is, uh, as you can imagine, because uh, they don't really like to tell the difference between pyrite and chalcopyrite. So this is the mid-time VTEM, just to give you an example with some of the drill highlights on the top and, and the late time there beneath. You can see that there's a, in the east, which we were calling the eastern VTEM anomaly, there's a steepening of the dip uh, after there's a, a major structure which we believe is running through there up to Orumba 21 in the north. So recently, uh, last month and the month before, we've collected some relatively good resolution gravity data over the top of this to try and find tools that can identify where the high grade mineralization might be that isn't affected by the pyrite. And gravity and magnetics are the two things that we've picked. We've run high resolution mag ground magnetics, 50 meter line spacing. This is 200 by 50 meter gravity. And we've done the SG on the diamond drilling and uh, that we've, that we've uh, completed a couple of months ago. The ore is definitely denser than the gang rock, as, as we would expect. Both supergene and hypergene ore zones are denser. Uh, and also, the, the, some of the ore, and quite a bit of it, is more magnetic subtly than the surrounding waste rock. So the magnetics are still being processed. We'll be releasing that soon. But what they've both highlighted is what we had anticipated, that are cross-cutting structures which are uh, influencing, controlling mineralization. We can see these dense bodies here which are running perpendicular to strike. The strike is running more or less east-west. Um, so how do you explain these linear north-south running 
anomalies. It almost looks as if we've intentionally drilled around them and missed every single gravity anomaly in this project. So we're pretty excited to go out there and, and drill these uh, structures out and drill these anomalies out and see what we can uncover. Um, but you can very easily see how you can drill 8,000 meters at a project and you can potentially miss the very best that that deposit has to offer. This is just a, uh, to give a visual of the early time VTEM anomaly uh, image and the drilling showing the gravity over the top. Um, you can obviously see that there's an offset between um, the various uh, data sets there. So this is a, a bit of a cheeky slide. This is Kamoa Bonanza zone uh, up on the top left. And um, I've turned our gravity image there on the side um, just because it, it looks a lot more, a lot similar when you, uh, when you turn it that way. And you can see that, you know, it's not, con it's not consistent. It's not just a general flat line bed. These Bonanza zones can occur in these systems. They can be quite tightly held compared to the overall scale of the system. Uh, and they are structurally, they are structurally controlled. And, you can definitely see how these types of zones could be sitting there at Waiaka, and we may not have identified them yet. And this is some of the stuff that we're drilling for. So I chucked this slide in here today after speaking to a few of my colleagues in the audience yesterday who were really keen on the pyrite textures. Um, this, this is not my field of expertise per se, but I put it in here uh, just for people to take a look at, and I'll make these slides available later as well. These uh, pyrite textures are coming from the upper the lower Tapley Hill formation above the ore zone. Uh, and there are a range of, of different textures you can see there. Um, and that one on the left-hand side is not, not pyrite, but it's, uh, it's just a, another example of the textures that we see in the, in the gang rock and the trap rock above the ore zone. I've also added a slide in here on the Chaka pyrite textures. I'm an economic geologist, so I prefer to look at the sulfides that have a copper in them. Uh, you can see that we have both semi-massive to massive blebby chalcopyrite in, in what's interpreted to be a feeder zone at Warumba 19. And we're also seeing underneath that disseminated uh, copper, which is kind of um, stratiform uh, disseminated chalcopyrite in there as well. Uh, we, haven't, we are seeing some bornite downhole in the diamond drilling and the RC drilling so far, um, but we know there's more there from the mining, from the, the uh, mined material at the surface. Uh, we're really hoping to see more of that uh, rich uh, bornite mineralization and drilling that's coming up. So this is Birthday Ridge. We don't just have reduced back black shale hosted um, and associated copper mineralization. There's sandstone hosted copper mineralization and siltstone hosted copper mineralization. Birthday Ridge is about 15k south from Waiaka. Uh, there is quite a bit of historical drilling there, mainly done in the 60s. It is a sediment hosted copper discovery that no one bothered to follow up on, really, uh, apart from a couple of drill holes put in there in 2008 by a company called Copper Range Limited. And you can see there's two kilometers of strike. They've really just drilled the leach zone and the super gene, part of the super gene zone there. Very shallow drilling, starting in copper mineralization, ending in copper mineralization, open to the north, open to the south, open across strike, waiting for someone to come in and drill it out properly with a new mindset. The diapiric breccias here, the contacts on the diapiers were never focused on. These are these are older sediments in Tapley Hill um, and are part of the um, Kalana group. Uh, one diamond hole that we have information for here that's at the core library that was actually drilled into the hypergene zone has disseminated chakapirate and bornite in it. And uh, so we know there is potential here to go through into a larger system at Birthday Ridge as well. Morgan's Creek, I'll just kind of finish on quickly. We're drilling there right now, uh, conducting a 4,000 metre drilling program and we are seeing from our we did a reconnaissance drilling program here we hit about 20 meters at 0.2 percent copper on that recon com program eight meters at half a percent copper um, so not not a world-class discovery hole but definitely indicating there's sediment hosted copper there um, and we drilled over quite a large area so it was scattered it was quite scattered drilling um, aimed at teaching us uh, what we needed to know to focus our exploration moving forward we're also hitting rare earth elements associated with the diapiers up to almost half a percent total rare earth oxides and lithium we're hitting up to 15 meters at 0.16 percent lithium from near surface so we're getting critical minerals and base metal potential here coexisting together and I'm, I'm certain that we have not seen all this project has to offer yet down here at Morgan's Creek geologically very complex every rock you look at striking in a different direction it's a very large diapiric breccia and it's got all the hallmarks of, of lots and lots of fluid flow lots of mineralization
So take home messages here. We believe there's significant potential for sediment hosted copper deposits and polymetallic deposits in the LA fold belt. We believe that is huge potential in the, uh, within the Mount Craig project as well. Um, could there be a Kamoa sized deposit in the Adelaide fold belt? There definitely could be. There's no reason why there couldn't be. Could one of those be at the Mount Craig project? Yes. If there wasn't a 20 million ton copper metal deposit, could there be a two to five million ton metal deposit? Absolutely. So that's what we're trying to find. That's what we're looking for. And we believe the potential is there. And, you know, I suppose the question I'll leave with is what would a Kamoa or Kapushi in the Adelaide fold belt do for the South Australian economy? That's what we hope to find out. That's it.